Hi, I'm Peter Houston, the Archivist at Mount Royal University, and this is, as you can see, a short introduction to medieval Christian manuscripts. We're going to uh, look at a number of examples of manuscripts that we have in our collection, um, most of them from Western Europe from kind of the uh, 12th to 16th century, um, and a few examples also from the Eastern churches as well. We'll begin by talking a little bit about how manuscripts were produced, um, and then move on to some of the, the main types of uh, religious texts that were, were produced in and used uh, in the medieval period. So, okay, let's begin with the definition. We should, we should get this out here. Um, a manuscript just refers to any text that is uh, written by hand. Um, that's where the word manuscript comes from, basically just means handwritten. So here's an example. This is a, a leaf, so an individual page we don't have any kind of complete uh, medieval manuscript works, we just have kind of fragments of them, pages that have been removed from books at some point uh, in their long lives. Uh, and so this one uh, is, is a leaf from a breviary, which is sort of a, a book meant for priests in the celebration of kind of the, the regular everyday daily round of, of kind of um, prayers, the, the kind of regular service that would, would take place on most days. Um, and you can see, yeah, the entire thing is written out by hand. In this case, like a lot of medieval texts, it has been beautifully uh, illuminated. Um, so illumination is it uh, just means it comes from the Latin word to lighten or to brighten, referring to the fact that that often medieval manuscripts, you know, were were decorated, um, sort of embellished uh, with with um, like precious metals. Uh, in this case, you're seeing actual kind of gold leaf that would reflect the light. Um, and, you know, and also uh, uh, pigments made from, you know, semi-precious stones, um, this kind of thing. Well, we'll get into, uh, into sort of the purposes of illumination now, but this is one of the, the real joys of kind of looking at medieval manuscripts is often they are stunningly beautiful kind of things. Um, and an awful lot of medieval books and kind of fragments of medieval books uh, survive to this day, um, partly because, you know, the, these works were... Uh, they were expensive to produce, they were therefore kind of treasured, um, and also just a huge number of them were produced, and a lot of the books produced in the medieval period were produced for the needs of the church. Um, so this is, you know, a good example. Every church in medieval Europe would have had a, a breviary like this, um, and often, you know, multiple copies of these were, were created, or multiple kind of versions were created as, as uh, you know, reforms kind of took place. Um, so yeah, there is there's a huge number of manuscript religious texts produced in the medieval period, and most medieval manuscripts surviving today are religious in nature for that reason. Okay, let's uh, take a quick look at the process. Um, so at, at how books were produced in Europe before, you know, the printing press was invented uh, in the 1450s and kind of spread throughout Europe. Before that, everything had to be done by hand, by scribes, like, like the one you see here. This is from a 16th century uh, printed Bible. Um, just a, a nice illustration showing a scribe at work. I'll kind of describe the, the process. So the scribe has uh, an exemplar, like a model text sitting on the lectern in front of him. Um, he's copying the text from into, uh, into the book on his lap uh, with a, a quill pen. Um, this would typically be made from, say, goose feathers, um, which you can see they take the feather off and using the pen knife, which you can see actually sitting in front of him uh, on his desk, uh, he'd, he'd trim the, the goose quill um, into a sort of a pen shape. And, uh, and also the pen knife would be useful as he's copying the text too, because he could sharpen his pen periodically um, with the pen knife. And, and also if he made a mistake, uh, he could actually scrape off a, a layer of parchment. I didn't mention this, but uh, medieval, generally, uh, the, the sort of main um, writing surface in uh, the medieval period was, was parchment, um, which is sort of treated animal skin. Um, paper kind of came came in the late later in the medieval period and uh, and eventually kind of supplanted parchment. But yeah, I, and you'll you'll see when I, we start looking at examples, um, I'll, I'll kind of point out some things that show you that you know what you're looking at in most medieval books is indeed parchment from animal sources rather than being uh, paper. So um, just going back to, to the scribe. So uh, the scribe has, has his quill. He's dipping it into, there's an inkwell on his desk, you can see here, that would contain like a carbon-based ink. Um, everything to do with the production of medieval books was from all natural sources. This is long before synthetic 
uh, inks and materials kind of kind of came came out. Um, and uh, yeah, and so you can see this would just be an incredibly laborious process if you have to sit there and copy it copy out every single page um, in, in a text, you know, that could run to be hundreds of pages long uh, or longer. Um, often scribes would work together in teams uh, because, you know, a, a long text could take a single scribe years to copy out. So sometimes they'd be working together in teams if, if you know, someone was commissioning a book and needed it done quicker. You might have a, a small team of scribes working on the same one, uh, working on different sections together, which would all be brought together um, when the book was bound. Um, so let's take a look at just just uh this is this is an example from a 13th century bible um i just wanted to show you so if you know if you look at the text here this is pretty cool because it is so teeny tiny we're, we're looking at text that's one or two millimeters tall um and if you zoom in you can see you know this is uh this is a, a scribe at work um you know this is a, a human person and people often make mistakes and you can see that often in, in medieval manuscript books uh, you find mistakes. So, for example, here, uh, I should mention the, te the text is in Latin. Most medieval texts, especially religious texts, would have been in Latin, the language of the church, the language of learning, um, which the clergy would be, uh, you know, uh, uh, trained uh, in. Um, but here, yeah, you can see a word has been crossed out in red. Um, looks like maybe, yeah, the scribe made a mistake, and I mentioned he could have scraped it off with his pen knife, but in this case, uh, missed it, and maybe the ink dried. So, and, uh, you know, he, he kept uh, writing the text. So anyways, he's gone back and, and actually crossed it off. There's another mistake if we look down here. Uh, this almost looks like, you know, it's, it's a different color. Maybe a, a later reader noticed a mistake and crossed off another kind of extra word. Because you can imagine if you're sort of looking back and forth between your exemplar or model text and the actual page, um, it'd be pretty easy to make a mistake. Uh, one thing I, I want to kind of point out is, is um, this isn't to do with scribes, but to do with kind of medieval readers. One thing that's kind of interesting is, is medieval and, and early modern readers, too, didn't have any qualms about kind of writing in the margins of books. Um, so you can see here a number of examples how a reader has actually interacted with this text, which again is, is uh, from, um, it, it's a Bible uh, leaf. This is, this is part of the book of Ecclesiastes in, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Um, one thing that, that sort of makes uh, medieval texts like this hard to read, um, I mean, there's a number of, of reasons that, that they're not that easy to read. One, of course, is it's in Latin. Another thing is, you know, with the sort of Gothic scribal hands, um, there isn't like a whole lot of uh, kind of, I mean, there, there isn't any kind of modern punctuation, paragraph breaks, that kind of thing. Um, so it can be hard to kind of navigate these texts. Um, they would use uh, different things like putting in those illuminated initials to kind of show, hey, here's a break in the text. Um, but you can see a later author has, has tried to make it a little easier to navigate by putting in column numbers for each uh, column of text here. So this is, you know, a later hand. It might have been centuries after the 13th century scribe that, that created this, this Bible. Um, but you can hear, see here they've, they've labeled each column 985, 986. And down here, it looks like the same, based on the color of the ink and the hand, probably the same reader has actually translated a section of the text, because um, this is the, the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, the Latin Bible, um, you know, translated uh, according to tradition by St. Jerome in the 7th century into what was then kind of the common tongue, um, you know, Latin, and the, what what had been the Holy Rome, or sorry, the, the Roman Empire. Um, but, but uh, here you can see um, someone has actually translated a section of the text from the Latin um, into uh, sort of an archaic form of English, maybe in the 16th century. Um, so you can see here uh, it says, Wisdom shall praise herself and be honored in God and rejoice in the midst of his people. Kind of neat to see yeah, a, a, a reader, um, I mean, still using this text hundreds of years after this book was scribed, um, but then also... Uh, you know, writing into the margins, kind of interacting with the text in that way. So I had, I had talked a little bit about how books are illuminated uh, or, or 
saying that books were illuminated in the medieval period, and this is a good example. This is a, a nice little um, breviary leaf uh, um, that uh, was, was created in France probably around the year 1400, and it has this wonderful illuminated initial here. Um, you can see uh, a letter O. Um, initials like this would would sort of signify a break in the text, you know, maybe a new a new chapter or at least the beginning of a, a new sentence, a new section. Um, kind of the bigger the initial, the more important kind of the break in the text was, because you can see without them, all the text just kind of runs together. It'd be very hard. There's no no kind of paragraph breaks. Um, but anyways, this O, um, after the scribe was done their work, uh, if if the person or institution commissioning uh, this this manuscript book uh, wanted to and, and wanted to spend the extra money, they could have a, uh, a specialized artist known as an illuminator who just was devoted to the book arts, you know, illustrating books, um, illuminate uh, the, the text. And so what we have here is, um, yeah, is, is a letter O that has this wonderful little, um, looks like some sort of little dragon uh, with a tail turning into leaves um, on this O. There's a number of reasons and why texts were illuminated. This is a very kind of modest example. We just have, you know, a few illuminated initials. Sometimes there would be big, beautiful, full-page illustrations known as miniatures. Um, there was a number of reasons why you might have a text, especially a religious text, illuminated. One of them just being, you know, that by illuminating it, by adding sort of precious metals and, and pigments uh, to a text, you're not just beautifying it, which of course is pleasing to the reader, um, but you're also honoring the text itself. So, you know, and in, in this case, maybe it's, you know, it's honoring, uh, it could be honoring like the, the word of God. Um, you know, this is a religious text. This is, this is from a breviary, um, which as I was saying, is kind of a, a prayer book meant for the use by the clergy. Um, yeah, you know, maybe I'll transition now into kind of talking about uh, some of the different types of manuscripts that were produced in the medieval period, uh, some of the most common types um, that were produced for use in the church. Um, and, and so, yeah, we'll start with the breviary. So I I'd already kind of gave you a, a brief kind of summary of, of what the breviary was, but every church and monastic house would, would own a breviary or, or multiple copies. Um, and basically, this is uh, the, the book that would kind of guide um, the priest or, or monks or nuns um, in the sort of daily celebration of what's known as the Liturgy of the Hours, or in England they call it the Divine Office. Um, this was kind of a regular daily service uh, that, um, that, say, in a monastic house would, would eight times a day at the canonical hours. There was uh, matins, lauds, prime, terse sex known, um, what else am I missing, vespers and compline, eight, eight sort of times the day that each day was kind of broken up into, into these eight hours. Um, and, and when those, the hour was reached, you know, the bells would ring, all the nuns or monks in that community would gather together in the church, and they would, uh, they would go through the, the, the sort of service um, where they would uh, chant psalms in Gregorian chant, they would, uh, you know, maybe have readings from the Bible, um, prayers would be said. This was kind of like the, the regular kind of rhythm of, of life in these monastic communities. And so this book contains all that you'd need to know to kind of partake in that liturgy of the hours. So all of, yeah, all of the prayers, chants, and everything. Um, and uh, yeah, associated with that, actually, the, the music itself wouldn't be included, at least isn't included in, in this example. But we do have uh, this. This is sort of the accompaniment to the breviary. This is a specialized choir book known as an uh, antiphonal. And the antiphonal would contain all of the music um, to be used in the Liturgy of the Hours. So in this case, uh, this is a, a big, 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 beautiful um, choir book leaf, antiphonal leaf um, from Spain from the 1490s, um, which it's, it's a whole different size than than this, the, the breviary that you see here, I, I you don't really get this when you're looking at them uh, digitized like this. Um, when you're in person, uh, you can have more of a sense of the size, so I'll try to describe it to you. This one is um, pretty small. It's like a kind of small paperback sized. Breviaries were, were often small because they're meant to be kind of carried around. They're meant to be very portable. Whereas the choir book leaf you see here is huge. It's the size of like, uh, maybe imagine you had sort of an open newspaper um, it's, it's that big. Um, 
And the reason it is that big is it wouldn't have left the church that it was in. It would be used, you know, every day again during the celebration of the Liturgy of the Hours. You would have an entire choir chanting off of this, this text. Um, so it needs to be big enough that everyone can see it in, you know, the sort of natural light in the church, whether it's by a candlelight or by, um, or by the light coming in through the windows. Uh, you can imagine a whole, you know, if this was in a monastic setting, um, you can imagine a whole choir of monks or nuns kind of gathered around this chanting together off of this text. Um, a neat thing about this one is it has this huge and wonderful, uh, wonderfully intricate um, illuminated initial here and R decorated in, I was saying this, this comes from Spain uh, in the 1490s, and you can really see here kind of the influence of, of Islamic art um, in this, you know, very kind of abstract, uh, I don't know, kind of stylized uh, uh, design, you know, no no figures depicted here. Um, but yeah, very, very much kind of shows the, the combination in Spain of kind of uh, Islamic and Christian kind of artistic traditions kind of coming together in the decoration of this manuscript. So another really important uh, sort of, th these are known as liturgical texts because they're, they um, are meant to um, kind of be used in the celebration of the liturgy, the, the public worship of the, 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 the Christian church. Um, uh, so this is a different type of liturgical text, uh, whereas the breviary and the antiphonal were for kind of the everyday, um, you know, eight times a day kind of service. Uh, this is a leaf from a missal, and missals were meant for the celebration of the Mass, which was the high point of every day, um, the most important uh, kind of liturgical ceremony in, in the church was was uh, the Mass, when uh, this is when, um, you know, the, the celebration of the Eucharist would take place, when the bread and wine would be transformed into the body and blood of Christ. Um, and, and so this book would contain all of the sort of prayers, Bible reading, ceremony to be used by the priest during the Mass. Uh, this book is quite big um, compared to the little tiny, you know, pocket-sized breviary that we looked at. Um, this one maybe not as big as the antiphonal, but it's, it's substantial. Um, maybe imagine sort of a large coffee table book. Um, and this would have sat on the altar in the church in sort of a place of honor. It wouldn't have moved. It would have uh, stayed there and, and would have been used again in in sort of the, the daily mass that would have taken place. Every day you would have, have, you would have one mass, um, sometimes on, on holidays or you know, holy days, uh, multiple masses. But, uh, but yeah, this, this was, uh, you know, kind of the focal point. I want to point out a couple things with this one. I mean, some really nice kind of pen work done by an illuminator here. Uh, very kind of simple in blue and red, but, but kind of elegant uh, pen work to make this, this quite a beautiful production. Also, like, uh, the Illuminator has added in a little marginal illustration here, a little face, um, just kind of for fun, I think. I don't think it, it, it really reflects the text in a big way. Um, but the other thing, oh, right, the other thing I want to show you, I mentioned, you know, talking about parchment and the fact that, you know, sometimes when you're looking at uh, medieval manuscripts, you see clues that tell you, like, this is actually from an animal. So here you can see, I don't know how well this will appear, but you might be able to see a, a bit of a dark line, kind of an irregular line running down here, running down here, kind of branching off. And what you're seeing here, it's known as veining. They're the actual veins of the animal, you know, could have been a, a cow that lived 500 plus years ago when this thing was, was produced that was slaughtered for the creation of this manuscript. And you can actually see yeah, the, the veins of the animal still um, totally noticeable today. We go over here too, you can also see the sort of hair follicles. So little tiny um, dots uh, on, on the parchment here, that would be the actual hair follicles. What we're looking at here is, is sort of the hair side of the, the parchment. Um, so, you know, the parchmenter would have scraped off all the, the hair and the skin from the other side um, as they go through the process of making it into, uh, into parchment. Um, but you can still see, as I said, kind of clues that show you that this this indeed did come from an animal. This is not paper that we're looking at. So, yeah. So every church would have had, you know, this this kind of a set of liturgical texts, breviaries, antiphonals, missals. Um, there were also graduals that contained uh, another type of specialized choir book that contained the music for use in the mass. Um, so yeah, every every church. 
and monastic house would have had, you know, kind of a, a good, good sized collection. In the case of some monasteries, large libraries full of texts related to the liturgy and to um, not just that, but also kind of the study of, of uh, scripture, which is what we're going to move on to now. So um, these are, we have two leaves, so two kind of disbound pages from uh, a Psalter. Um, so a Psalter is just the book of Psalms, um, which is kind of the, the poetry of the Old Testament. Often in the medi medieval period, uh, the Psalms would be set to music and would be chanted. Um, and this comes, yeah, as I said, from England uh, from the 14th century. And yeah, beautifully illuminated with all sorts of wonderful uh, decoration here from, you know, a small bird. Here's a, a little creature, or it's kind of a person um, in the border. Uh, unfortunately, their face is flaked off, but they're pointing, they might be pointing out at kind of an important or significant uh, part of the text there. Sometimes illumination could be used to kind of uh, point out important things. Um, and then all these kind of tenderly borders, illuminated initials. This is, it, it's quite richly illuminated for such a, this, this is a, a tiny little book, you know, maybe about this size. Um, the reason that I, I chose to, I want to talk about uh, sort of medieval manuscript copies of the Bible, but I want to start off with the Psalter um, because for kind of the early, early medieval period and right into the, the middle medieval period, um, the Bible typically wasn't a single volume. It was it was a whole collection of, of books. Um, so, you know, if if you had a Bible, um, it would consist of, you might have your Psalter, you might have a gospel book um, that would contain, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It, it might contain, um, you know, you might have another volume that would have uh, parts of the Old Testament. So, so the Bible was really for yeah for a good part of the medieval period sort of a, a collection of texts a number of different volumes and it was only in the 13th century that that there was this real effort to kind of bring it all together in one one easily portable kind of volume um, which I want to show you an example of now um, this was known as the the pocket Bible and this was an innovation that came out of Paris uh, in sort of the, the mid uh, 13th century. Um, actually kind of the early 13th century. Um, and, and we have here uh, an example, a Parisian example of a, a pocket Bible leaf. Again, just we only have a single page. Um, but it was it was a, a real important kind of step in the evolution of, of the Bible as, as a text. Um, this kind of grew out of the need of, say, theological scholars and students. Paris was uh, super important with the University of Paris was a very important center for kind of theological studies. And so uh, kind of in response to the needs of, as I was saying, scholars and students, um, they, they came up with this idea of, of kind of packaging all the, you know, the diverse parts of the Bible into a single portable kind of book. Um, and, and yeah, this was kind of revolutionary at the time. Um, and really, the Bible has not changed in format very much since, in like the the, the eight hundred years uh, since this this kind of revolutionary idea kind of kind of took root. Um, so you can see here, you know, this one is from about twelve sixty. Um, you can see it doesn't look a whole lot different uh, than than the format of a Bible today. So we have, you know, it's about the same size. You know, this thing is again. I'm gonna have to just have to hold up my hand, you know, about the size of a modern Bible. This is how big that leaf is. Um, it would be bound in, you know, black leather, typically, um, like uh, like most modern Bibles. Now you can see too, uh, it has kind of two columns of text. Um, and and the whole kind of format of formatting of the Bible was standardized. It was in the 13th century with these pocket Bibles that they first kind of put the Bible into its, its sort of present form, you know, all the books in the order from the Old Testament to, to the New, um, and then, yeah, sort of arrange them by uh, by book. So here we have, this is from the, the book um, of Obadiah, one of the, the minor sort of Old Testament prophets. So at the top we have kind of a chapter heading um, referring to, to Obadiah so that you can, you can tell what it is. And here we actually have the opening of the book, um, a nice little illuminated initial showing the prophet himself holding a scroll that's supposed to represent uh, his book, which is also the apparently the smallest um, book in the Bible. Um, but yeah, really kind of delightful. It survived. Uh, you can see his little face. Um, and this is, again, super teeny tiny. Um, 
you know, the the text is only like millimeter, uh, a millimeter or two tall, and it's on super, super thin paper too. And all this kind of combined to create, uh, as I was saying, a very, very easily portable Bible, which was well suited to, say, students at the university, you know, that would, might be carrying this around, uh, going to lecture or wherever, um, they could carry the text with them. Also was really useful for uh, friars that who were maybe going out and preaching in the countryside, you know, Dominicans and Franciscans that might actually be traveling around, um, sort of spreading, <laughs> spreading the word, uh, and might want to have a copy of, of the Bible with them. Um, so yeah, it, it was very, very popular, it became a big bestseller, uh, and and a huge number of these were produced in the 13th century, especially in, in Paris, which was a big center of manuscript production. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. Um, you can see uh, chapter, uh, they, they also started using chapter numbers uh, in the Bible uh, in the 13th century. Verses came later, that was more of a 16th century innovation. Um, but yeah, uh, just, just kind of interesting seeing the evolution of this form to something that we would recognize as, as the Bible um, today. So Now if you were studying uh, the Bible in the medieval period, you would not only want kind of the source material, the actual kind of word of God, uh, but you would also maybe be drawing on a kind of biblical commentary, and that's what we, we have here. Um, this is a commentary by, um, this, this, this text is known as the Moralia in Job. It's commentary on the, the Old Testament book of Job um, that was first written in the 7th century by uh, St. Gregory the Great, also known as, as Pope Gregory the I, um, who was sort of uh, renowned as you know, one of the church fathers and wrote this gigantic book uh, kind of analyzing um, the, the book of Job. Um, we have, this is just a little fragment of a leaf from it, um, uh, but a good example of that kind of biblical commentary, which would be used again by theological scholars, by students, that kind of thing to kind of interpret, uh, you know, God's word. Um, this one's kind of neat because it's the oldest text that we have in our collection. This one comes from, uh, we don't have an exact date, but oh, none of these we have exact dates for, but this one based on the, the very kind of old form of handwriting here, uh, Carolingian minuscule, which was used in the Holy Roman Empire of Charlemagne. Um, this, this could be maybe in the range of 900 years old. Um, the neat thing though, or the neat thing about that too, is, is not only is this thing like close to a thousand years old, um, but this uh, just the age alone would put this squarely in the period of kind of monastic uh, manuscript production. So in the, the early and, and sort of, yeah, early Middle Ages, um, most production of books was being done in the, the monastic houses of Europe. Uh, so by monks and nuns, it was part of their, their religious duties. You know, if you're copying uh, sort of sacred texts, you're also kind of reading and maybe meditating on them at the same time. Um, and they would produce texts for use uh, by their, you know, the, the sort of religious institutions that they were part of. Um, and also the monasteries would, would uh, also take commissions from people outside of the, the you know, the cloister, um, the monastery walls, um, as a ways to kind of uh, support the, the running of, you know, the kind of provide a bit of a, a source of funding um, for the monastery itself. So it was a way to kind of not only kind of serve the textual needs of the, the monastic community, but also to kind of raise money as well. So in the early, yeah, up until about um, uh, the 1200s, uh, most book production was, was being done. You know, the scribes and illuminators would have been working, would have been professional religious working in the monastery's walls. After that, though, uh, I mean, cities and, say, you know, universities were popping up throughout Europe, cities were growing, and so in the 13th century you saw a real kind of gradual shift of um, book production sort of out of the monasteries into those new urban centers where there was a new kind of secular trade, uh, you know, craftsmen who weren't, who weren't uh, monks and nuns or priests, uh, you know, they were secular kind of tradesmen uh, would, would um, create books uh, for commission. So yeah, kind of a shift there. Okay, let's look now at a kind of personal devotion. So all the texts that we've looked at so far are meant for kind of religious professionals. You know, we looked at those liturgical books, 
uh, you know, used by priests and monks and nuns in the celebration of, you know, of the Eucharist and other kind of um, moments or kind of public worship of the churches, um, the breviaries, antiphonals, missals. And then we looked at, at kind of the Bible itself and the books that made up the Bible and biblical commentaries. Again, these wouldn't be things that ordinary people would would read. These would be uh, the preserve of, you know, of the clergy, of, of people associated with the church. Um, I now want to turn to uh, uh, sort of the, the main example of kind of a popular devotional text. So there were, you know, there were kind of popular religious texts in the medieval period. There were different, uh, you know, prayer books, hagiographies. These are sort of collections of saints' lives. Um, and, and sort of most famous of all, most well-known, and, and probably most common in terms of uh, sort of survivals to present day are, are the, a book of hours. And that's what you see in front of you are some leaves from a French book of hours from kind of the late 15th century. Now, the book of hours, uh, it, it wasn't like an official kind of church text. Um, it was it was sort of produced uh, for for not for use by the clergy, but for kind of ordinary people. Um, you know, there were a lot of very devout people in in medieval uh, Europe, and and uh, there was sort of a desire to emulate the life of the professional religious to kind of emulate you know that that kind of rhythm and daily round of prayer and reflection that was taking place in the monasteries, and so. Uh, it was, again, sort of in the, the 13th century, when, when the Book of Hours started kind of taking a form, um, because, uh, yeah, so it, it sort of filled that, that need because um, it basically contained like a stripped-down version of the Liturgy of the Hours, um, and, and as well as kind of other texts or gospel readings and prayers to different saints that, that were kind of combined uh, to form this Book of Hours. And it was called that because um, at, at its heart, it was, as I was saying, kind of a stripped-down version of the Liturgy of the Hours, and it was uh, sort of devoted or focused on devotion to the Virgin Mary, um, and yeah. And so ordinary people, you know, would could buy this. Uh, of course, I say ordinary people, but you'd still have to be sort of wealthy enough to actually be able to afford a, a book, and books were extremely expensive, you know, given the labor involved and the materials. Um, and uh, I've lost my train of thought. Um, and so, yeah, so I mean, if you were if you were someone of sort of sufficient economic means and you also had uh, were literate, you know, you're actually able to read, um, you could purchase purchase a book of hours um, like this one. This one, you know, is, is nicely illuminated, has these beautiful um, uh, sort of decorative borders on every page with uh, we have three leaves from this book, and each one has a different kind of mythical creature, and these really intricate, um, teeny tiny uh, uh, illuminated initials. It's, it's quite beautiful. Um, so this is probably someone with, with de decent kind of wealth, um, though there's some examples too of ones created for uh, super wealthy um, aristocrats that, that just eclipse this in terms of kind of luxury, and we're real kind of yeah, absolutely luxury items, um, pretty show-stopping things. Um, now we don't have any complete medieval manuscript books, I was saying, but we do have a really nice, uh, sort of Renaissance, uh, book of hours that was printed. Um, so this one comes from Paris. Paris, as I was saying, was such a, a big production, um, hub for, for books. Uh, this one was printed in, in the early 1520s, uh, in Paris. And the neat thing about this one is it's, it's early enough in the period of printed books that they're actually trying to make it look like a manuscript. So you can see um, the script here is, is all done in sort of that kind of a gothic black letter that is supposed to look like uh, the old scribal hands. Um, you can see too, uh, whoever, whoever bought this, this copy of this printed book of hours paid extra to have an illuminator paint over what would have been um, like metal cut, uh, border illustrations. You can see them coming through a bit here actually, um, but they've painted over it to make it look like a, a hand done miniature. I mean it, it is painted by hand over top. So here we have, um, this is a, a depiction of Pentecost, so you can see the Holy Spirit descending as a dove from, here's Jesus and God the Father, descending, oh with, with a big book, uh, God's Word, um, descending on the assembled uh, disciples and Mary. Again Mary is, is just you know, the central figure 
uh, in the Book of Hours. Um, so, you know, um, and then on the other side here, we have uh, a scene depicting the Passion of Christ. Here is um, Christ uh, already, you know, stripped of his clothes with the crown of thorns on. Above him, this is supposed to be Pontius Pilate condemning him to death. And then down here, we have a um, number of clergymen. I I'm not sure if, if they're supposed to be uh, sort of contemporary, uh, you know, 16th century clergymen. Uh, we've got like a bishop and a friar and maybe a priest. Um, worshiping Christ, or whether they're supposed to depict uh, maybe the Jewish authorities. I'm not. I'm not really sure. Um, but anyways, uh, you can see, you know, someone has gone to a lot of extra effort to to make this look like look like a, a manuscript because there was a real special kind of cachet attached to manuscripts that that print copies just didn't have uh, in this early kind of period. Um, another thing that you'd often find, you know, besides the the um, uh, that sort of adapted liturgy of the hours that was devoted to the Virgin Mary, the little office of the Virgin, it was called. Uh, um, that was kind of the central text, but there was a number of other pieces to the Book of Hours. Uh, and, and another very common part was what was known as the suffrages of the saints. And that's what we have here. Uh, we have a number of prayers to individual saints. Um, so here's a prayer to St. Nicholas. Uh, over here we have a prayer to Saint Sebastian, um, who's actually known as being a, an effective um, intercessor. This is someone who can kind of go to God with with your uh, with your kind of requests. Um, he was known as being an effective intercessor for the plague stricken, so maybe a you know an important saint for our own time. Um, and yeah, this is the thing in in the Book of Hours you see a real uh, sort of good reflection of kind of late medieval. In this case, kind of, kind of Renaissance piety, um, you know, this idea that that you, as a poor sinner, you can't uh, sort of dare to approach God and His Majesty uh, yourself. Um, you have to work through these intercessors, these these holy men and women, um, or you know, the most important one of them all being being um, the Virgin Mary, um, who, because of their standing, uh, can sort of approach. God and bring your request to him, to Jesus and God the Father, um, on your behalf. Um, you know, this this idea that you need to have an intercessor um, to, to kind of bring your prayers um, to God. In uh, kind of juxtaposition to that, uh, this, uh, here's a couple leaves from uh, uh, an Elizabethan prayer book that we actually have a complete copy of, published in London in, the, in 1590. Um, this is is really interesting because this is uh, this is from you know, Protestant England uh, after the the Reformation, uh, and so even though in a lot of ways it looks similar to the Book of Hours that we just looked at, and and indeed it's based off of it, you can see you know even the format's kind of similar, um, and here it makes mention of suffrages. There's a lot of important distinctions that uh, that really show you that this is this is a Protestant work and not kind of a traditional Catholic one. Um, first of all, it's not in Latin. Uh, it is in English, you know, kind of the vernacular. And this this was, you know, a, a, a very important thing to the Protestant reformers, you know, this belief that everyone should have the ability to read God's word in their own language uh, without having to have a priest to kind of translate it for them or interpret it for them, um, that they should be able to have this kind of direct relationship with, with God, with their Savior. And that's what you kind of get through here too. So here, you know, this this part is called the suffrages, um, but no longer do you see any references to the saints or the Virgin Mary. Um, all the prayers here are directed to God directly. So you can see, you know, they all start, Oh God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy upon us, miserable sinners. Um, again, this, this sort of Protestant idea that, you know, no longer do you have to have uh, yeah, priests or, or saints um, to, to kind of intercede on your behalf. Um, you should be able to have this direct relationship uh, with your God. So kind of an interesting kind of counterpoint uh, to that, that very Catholic book of ours we just looked at. Um, this one's neat too because it has these wonderful woodcut illustrations uh, in the borders here, here showing uh, the Dance of Death, a wonderfully morbid um, kind of series uh, showing, in this case, it's, it's all of these different members of Elizabethan society, uh, from the rich and powerful to the poorest of the poor, um, being led off to their graves by a grinning skeleton that represents death. And, and basically the, the message being, you know, no matter who you are, we're all mortal, we're all doomed to die, so, so 
uh, it's a moral message. Put your trust in in your savior, and you know, hope for eternal life. So, okay. Uh, now I want to move to the Eastern churches briefly. We don't have nearly as much in our collection relating to the Eastern Christian churches, but I want to show you a few examples of what we do have. Um, so this first one uh, comes from from Egypt. Uh, this is a leaf from a an uh, from the Coptic Church in Egypt from one of their uh, liturgical books so again meant for use by by the priest in the celebration of you know of of uh their their kind of public worship um and this one's interesting though i mean you can see language it's it's not latin it's not uh you know uh, um european kind of vernacular this is in uh there's actually in two languages it's bilingual so on the left here we have um the text in uh in boharic uh, which is the sort of liturgical language of the Coptic Church, um, almost almost like the the Coptic uh, version of Latin, um, you know, no longer used by the general population, but still used in the church. And then on the right here, we have a uh, translation into Arabic, which which would have been readable by by kind of the wider population. This one comes from the 1550s, and yeah, a nice example of of kind of that that Eastern. Christian manuscript tradition, which was, you know, very, very different in ways than, than what was going on in the West and, and an ancient tradition going back centuries. Um, here is another example of a Coptic text. This one comes from, uh, from Ethiopia. Uh, and the neat thing about this one is this is well out of the medieval period. This is from the 19th century. Um, this is a Bible, a manuscript Bible. We have the entire, uh, the entirety of it. Um, it's, it's interesting too, because uh, like the Parisian pocket Bible we looked at, this one is very small, meant to be portable, meant to be, say, carried around by, by you know, a, a priest or preacher traveling from village to village. And so not only is it small, but it actually comes with a very robust um, sort of goat leather carrying case uh, with a strap on it that, you know, a priest could, say, carry on his shoulder as he walked uh, between communities. Um this one, uh, it, yeah, it's really neat because it's from, as I said, the 19th century, showing just how long uh, manuscript kind of culture endured in some parts of the world. I mean, in Western Europe, uh, the, you know, with the introdu introduction, sorry, of the, the printing press uh, in the mid 15th century, um, over, the, over the 15th and sort of the 16th centuries, manuscript culture largely kind of collapsed and was replaced by the printing press. But this wasn't the case in, in all parts of the world and not all parts of the Christian world. Um, so here, yeah, in, in Ethiopia and Africa, uh, you know, well into the 19th century, um, you know, sacred texts were still being written out by hand by scribes. Um, you can see written in, uh, in Giyaz, the, the language of the, the very distinctive kind of script of the, um, the Ethiopian Coptic church with a uh, very kind of cool traditional um, Ethiopian iconography here. Um, I'm not sure who, who this depicts, but obviously two saints with their halos. Uh, and then one last uh, one last example. This one also 19th century. Uh, this one comes from Russia. This is a leaf from a, uh, this is both sides of a single leaf from a choir book. Um, but again, written out by hand and a very, very distinctive pen and notation that was used by the old believers, kind of a breakaway sect, had broken away from the mainstream Russian Orthodox Church in the early 18th century and continued to practice their own traditions, uh, often kind of persecuted by the, the mainstream church. And part of that was sticking to really traditional um, uh, uh, production methods of, you know, of, of, I mean, traditional kind of liturgical music and also even the way that they, they create their books uh, still by hand, even though printing presses were available uh, in in Russia. Um, this this particular sect uh, continued doing them by hand. So, just showing you again that you know even well after the medieval period kind of came to a close, manuscript production didn't entirely disappear. Okay, and that brings us to the end of our little overview. So, if you wanted to check out anything that that uh, any of the items that I just showed you, you can always go to our our database. We have. Um, just in the top left-hand corner here, the web address archives.mtworld.ca. We've digitized almost all of the examples that you've, you've seen. Almost all of our sort of manuscript and early print collections have been digitized. You can take a look at them, download them even in, in high resolution. 
Um, and yeah, I encourage you to take a look, you know, once uh, once um, the archives is, is open, once uh, things get back to normal, once the pandemic ends, um, you can also come in and actually take a look at, at these examples in person. They are wonderful to see in person, to see, you know, that the bright colors, the gold leaf, uh, it's it's quite stunning. So I encourage you to, to think about that. You can also get in touch with me if you have any questions. Uh, I've got my email address there, phouston at mtworld.ca. And um, yeah, thanks very much for watching. I hope this has been useful.